Welcome everybody to the uh, Bristol Distinguished Address. A very special welcome also to our speaker tonight, uh, Lisa Opie. And it's brilliant to have you here this uh, week, Lisa, when we've also been celebrating International Women's Day and uh, we had an event today as well in the university, so um, that just adds a little extra something. Um, I'm really excited to hear what Lisa's going to say tonight. Um, I must admit I have a vested interest. Before I joined UWE, I spent 10 years in broadcasting myself at an Australian television network called SBS. There I ran SBS 1 and 2, acquiring content, commissioning and programming everything that went to air. So I know the sorts of pressures that Lisa works under. The BBC was always a beacon of exciting shows and talent, and I've also followed Lisa's career and watched, bought, and loved many of her shows. Of course, now I also lead a faculty that houses the Department of Film and Journalism, nurturing and supporting our own programme makers and screen talent. So Lisa, you've got a captive audience in both me and my faculty colleagues, and I hope a growing pool of talent to draw from. Now, before we get going, just some brief housekeeping. There are no fire alarms planned, so if the alarm sounds, please follow the event staff to the nearest exit. Um, shortly, I'm going to introduce our speakers, and then I'll be back to host a Q&A after Lisa has given her talk. Um, I'm a tough chair, but please start thinking of your questions. Um, we'll end the event with a little networking over drinks in the atrium. Now, um, as we're here this evening, please get involved on Twitter, and you can use the hashtag Bristol Lectures, and uh, you can tweet your comments and pictures uh, following the event as well. Um, remember that the pre-address interview and podcast with Lisa will also be available online in a couple of days. So, let's get going. And to introduce um, Lisa, I'd like to ask Paul Appleby to uh, come up and uh, give that introduction, as well as being a uh, sort of man about town in, in terms of <laughs> Bristol Media, you are in fact board director of Bristol Media. So Paul, please come and introduce Lisa. Thank you. As you probably discovered, I've never been called a man about town before, but it's a jolly good, it's a jolly good starting point. Um, I'd like to start, uh, first of all, by welcoming Lisa. I'm really looking forward to, to hearing how things are developing with studios. So this is a really important night, I think, for all of us. A little bit about Bristol Media. We are one of the uh, supporters of this whole series of, uh, of distinguished addresses. Um, we've existed, we're essentially a membership company for the creative industries in the region, centred on Bristol, but slightly wider as well. Um, existed since 2005 with members including the BBC uh, and Ardman right the way down. Uh, well, down is a pejorative term, right the way across to individual freelancers. So that's about 600 members, probably 7,000 people that are actively engaged in the creation of content in Bristol. And I'd like to think that that, that uh, history, that 15-year history, has helped to raise the profile of the area. Um, as part of the UK's creative landscape. The BBC itself has been here since 1934, uh, which is a jolly long time. It's always been in White Ladies Road, for the, those of you that know the building. Um, and it's actually one of the three largest centres in England now. Um, Channel 4 are also now here. They arrived a bit later than the BBC, so they've been here since last October. But they're catching up, which is good to know. And again, Bristol is one of the three places that they exist within, within England. Uh, I actually personally used to work in the Natural History Unit, which I suspect will be part of the feature tonight. That's existed in Bristol since 1946, even before I started working there, and has a great reputation for that commercial activity uh, <coughs> that has actually driven the, the development of BBC Studios as its own entity. That goes right back to the days of David Attenborough's Life on Earth and the co-production deals that actually delivered that series. You'll have read the, uh, the blurb about Lisa, um, so I'm not going to recant that to you. Um, the fact is that, that um, her early career started was in BBC Wales. 
Early careers are a really important thing. Um, the BBC's existence actually helps to get people into the industry, which is a key thing from a very diverse background. And plotting that route through, you can see an adoption of technologies as they developed. So Lisa was there when BSB started. For those of you who might remember that, it had square aerials. Um, that was before B Sky B, it was before Sky. So when satellite television started, Lisa was there. When digital television started, Lisa was there with UK TV and Channel 5. So this is a development that we've seen across broadcasting. And prior to working at the BBC, she was with 24, who were uh, headquartered in Plymouth, and again, a huge provider of digital content. So this is somebody that has actually tracked the whole development of, uh, of broadcasting in the UK. Um, joined the BBC in 2013, and then with the formation of studios, uh, joined that and is now the MD. Um, it should be clear to everybody, I'm sure it is to the people in this room, that the BBC is massively admired internationally. Um, it's part of the soft power that the UK has and which will become more and more important. There are issues around perceived bias, but if that's from both sides of the political spectrum, I guess that might be quite a good thing. Uh, if it was only one side, then you might question it. There's a question over the licence fee. When we're paying subscriptions to those awfully nice people at Netflix, we're getting a tax on, uh, on having a TV licence. But is that a tax? Is that a benefit? I would contend that the benefit we get from the existence of the BBC is far more than we pay for it. Um, there's a whole issue of cost of licence fees for the over-75s, uh, for whom BBC services might actually be the ultimate public service, um, second only possibly to the NHS. So there's a realisation that there's a change. There's a big change that's happening. There's a big change in terms of how we um, develop, how we develop communications, how we develop digital services, how we address the climate emergency. So the idea that TV is a force for good is a very prescient idea, and I can't imagine anybody better to lead us through that than Lisa Opie. Floor's yours. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you very much, Jane. And thank you um, to the University of West of England for inviting me. So when BBC Studios launched, uh, opened its doors in 2017, it was a really exciting time. Having been the in-house production arm of the BBC for 60 years plus, we became an independent commercial entity, able to make content for any platform or broad broadcaster around the world. For the first time, our experienced producers could establish multiple creative conversations, learning firsthand about the challenges of engaging and delivering a diverse and global audience. But there was some pre-launch who feared the loss of the very thing that had defined us, our public service purpose. It ran deep in our DNA. It motivated our teams to inform, educate and entertain. Our Rethian values were what made people want to work with us a sense of purpose, the ambition to speak truth to power. People came to us to make programmes that mattered and to do the best work of their lives. The question for us, especially in our factual division in particular, was, now that, that, that was how that drive and commitment would sit alongside the need to survive in a commercial world. Would making money interfere? Would we be reduced to creating content that compromised our ethos? It was a really weighty uh, question that we asked ourselves, but surprisingly, the answer was a very simple one. The truth, of course, was that our greatest strength in the public sector was also our greatest strength in the commercial sector. Our USP was our ability to tell stories that mattered, that denoted quality, credibility, truth and innovation. People communities and societies, and therefore platforms and broadcasters that serve them around the world need stories brilliantly told. Three years in, and BBC Studios, having merged with BBC Worldwide, the BBC's distribution business, is a committed partner to the UK's thriving independent production uh, community, as well as other broadcasters and, pla and digital platforms, delivering content that showcases the very best of British talent. 
As well as our own content, BBC Studios have funded and distributed some of the best and boldest British content in recent history and supported the UK's television industry on the world stage. The programmes we make within BBC Studios have been sold in hundreds of territories around the world. We make them from our seven production bases across the UK, where we create around 2,000 hours of content annually, ranging from big global hits to award-winning comedies, much-loved continuing drama, complex live events, and extraordinary range of factual programmes. Last year, we won 80 awards for our programmes um, and we returned over £243 million to the BBC. We're telling stories that matter, that live up to the BBC kite mark around the world and talent still come to us to do their best work. Here's a quick look at what we've been up to. Um, it's been quite a journey, um, and we've still got a long way to go, but as we continue to grow and develop our business, there is, for, what, for me, one thing that remains incredibly important, and that's the role that we as producers play in serving our audiences, both here in the UK and internationally. Television as a force for good. Well, the converse is true, of course, which is why the world needs storytellers that they can trust, and ultimately, as program makers, that's what we're here to do, tell stories. But in the age where audiences now have more choice than ever before, more access to content and more ways of viewing it, program makers face huge challenges. Young audiences in particular who in their lifetime have seen the launch of Google, Facebook, YouTube, Spotify, Twitter, TikTok, and I'm sure many more. As we know, they are increasingly hard to reach. Research shows that globally in 2018, viewing on smartphones, tablets and streaming devices made up 48% of young audiences' daily viewing habits. Conversely, linear viewing has decreased considerably, down 36% for that same demographic since 2016. The rise of global SVODs, like Netflix, with its 167 million subscribers worldwide, or Amazon, or Disney+, Plus, whose subscription numbers are expected to equal that of Netflix by 2014. That rise has been well documented. Despite this, though, what we know is that when producers deliver high-quality, original content, um, audiences around the world show up to watch it. The BBC's 2019 Christmas special of Gavin and Stacey was watched by a record 17.1 million viewers on BBC One, whilst our very own Planet Earth 2, produced by the NHU here in Bristol, became the most watched natural, natural history programme in the UK in 15 years. The iguana versus snake sequence became a global viral sensation with over 400 million views. Within the UK, on average, 9 in 10 adults tune into the BBC each week. The worldwide viewership for the BBC hits about 430 million. An indication, perhaps, that even at a time of increasing division, audiences still look to television for some sort of shared understanding, for shared conversations, and to see what connects us rather than what divides us. 
For young audiences in particular, the thirst for authentic, trusted content, content that points to the truth, however good or bad that may be, is even greater than it's been before. As producers, we're in an enviable position of being able to deliver it, to explore new stories and share a multitude of perspectives with the broadest possible audiences. And it's that privilege that on occasion has allowed us to highlight global issues and is, as a result changes perspectives, reflect our audiences and serve as a force for good. Television does not set out to change the world, but it has at its best done exactly that. Supporting our audiences and communities around the world is, as I said, inherent in our BBC values. It's why for every one pound of licence fee spent, the BBC generates two pounds in value. It's also why we're constantly looking at more ways to do it, to deliver maximum value back to the licence fee payer. Whether that's regionally through local BBC radio stations, which in times of crisis, like the recent floods, offer comfort to affected audiences and communities, or nationally, when the BBC News Evening coverage, still the most watched programme in the UK, or globally, communicating critical advice to viewers and listeners worldwide, most recently in response to escalating concerns around the spread of COVID-19, as we know. Or even by creating new services, finding new ways of engaging, like BBC Radio has done with BBC Sounds, with its three million listeners to date. In BBC Studios, that desire to serve and support is just as strong. And we do so the best way we know how, which is by creating quality, original content that matters and, importantly, entertains. BBC Bristol is home to some of the most popular uh, factual programmes of the past 20 years. I will come on to the Natural History uh, Unit shortly, but first I want to talk to you about a team who over the years have been responsible for several flagship series here, including Country File, Antiques Roadshow, Bargain Hunt, Gardener's World and the hugely popular DIY SOS, now in its 20th year. In 2016, DIY SOS was nominated for a Mind Mental Health Award. It also won the RTS Award for Best Popular Factual and Features Programme. In December of last year, the production team were honoured with a BAFTA Special Award, celebrating both their contribution to television and the programme's wide-reaching impact on the nation. Here's a recent trail from DIY SOS's 20th anniversary celebrations. Over the last 20 years, DIY SOS has built spectacular homes. No on, have a look. Ambitious children in need centres. No. My imagination no. couldn't reach this far. No, no. And I've got one heck of a imagination. <laughs> <laughs> and even renovated an entire street. I never thought that there was that many people out there who was willing to do stuff for people like myself and other veterans. Thank you very much. I love you. We've had a load of laughs. You've got to look away. This is pretty unpleasant. Ow! Oh, that's going to hurt. Ooh. Some with royals. Tell them my name is. Prince of Darkness. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and had the honour to work with over 20,000 build volunteers. Probably best day of my working life. Just been unbelievable. Through their sheer hard work and graft, we've completed 205 builds. Bit of a push, but, you know, we've got a good team of everybody working together. And we've been about a bit. These vans have done some miles all over the country, from Land's End to John O'Groats, from West Wales to Hull. Now, in our 20th anniversary year, I'm taking a road trip around Britain to find out what happened after we left. Who was the first bit of cake? And how it changed the lives of families. <laughs> Even six years on, just so grateful of what those people did for us. Communities. You've seen kids growing in here. It's amazing. And the volunteers themselves. At the end of it, you're going to see a family who can't exist until we do something like this for them. Every build has touched us all. It's been an amazing 20 years of DIY SLA! It's an amazing series, never fails to make me cry. Um, DIY SOS started as a home improvement series in which Nick Knowles and his trusted Purple Hearts travelled the country rectifying a multitude of DIY disasters. But since its initial carnation, the programme has become something much more. 
offering to help families with the greatest need, raising the spirits of communities in desperate need of a lifeline, and shining a light on some of the many challenges that people face all over the country in their day-to-day -day lives. Over the course of more than 200 episodes, DIY SOS has helped people with disabilities, debilitating illness, mental health issues, homelessness and flooding, always with sensitivity, a few tears and a lot of help. But what is perhaps more striking than the range of issues the series has covered is the impact that it's had on communities over the UK. To date, the show has helped more than 200 different households and completed around £16 million worth of building work. In 2012, the Children in Need, it overhauled a special needs education centre in Edinburgh that currently serves around 1,500 children. And in 2018, in a special big build, the team created a new community space for the local residents affected by the Grenfell Tower fires. They also built a gym for the Dale Youth Boxing Club that you saw there, whose premises were destroyed by the fire. It was an amazing feat and, and involved a voluntary services of more than 400 people, tradesmen, and women. And this perhaps is what the de best demonstrates that positive influence that television can have in the community. DIS, uh, DIY uh, SOS would not be able to continue without the generosity and the time of hundreds of volunteers around the country, often more than can actually be used. At the heart of it, it's a programme that showcases British communities at their very best and in doing so inspires action and a sense of hope in many others. But just as important as those programmes which draw attention to what unites us are the programmes which celebrate the many differences between us. In 2018, in, a, in an attempt to radically improve the presentation of women on screen, the BBC launched the 5050 project. Initially trialled in one of our news programmes for one month, the methodology of the 5050 project was really simple. Programmes volunteered to track their overall percentage of men and women across all presenters, experts and contributors each month, giving greater visibility to men and women across all programmes, from presenters to experts. It gave us so much visibility of that male-female ratio and encouraged those involved to think about their on-screen makeup. As a trial, it proved to be hugely successful, and two years on, it's the biggest collective action to increase women's representation on BBC content that there has ever been, with more than 500 teams now bought into it across the organisation. Across studios, we currently have 12 unscripted productions signed up to 5050, including The One Show, Spring Watch, Country File and Gardener's World, and have recently extended the scheme to include the scripted programming we make. So we're hoping that that list will grow rapidly. It's the simple idea that really works well. But the BBC's commitment to creating content which fully reflects the breadth and diversity of the UK audiences extends beyond the representation of women. It's about much more than simply putting more diversity on screen. It's about the breadth of the stories that we tell. About seizing the opportunity to challenge preconceived notions of what society looks like and constantly asking the question, can we do more? In September 2017, we produced a two-part series which followed six individuals, each with different physical disabilities, on an ambitious and sometimes emotional 900-mile journey across Vietnam. Also made here in Bristol, the programme was called Without Limits. What this powerful documentary set about challenging was the assumption that disability in itself was limiting. It was totally engaging, a story really well told, that first and foremost gave viewers an insight into the lives of six brilliant and courageous contributors. Their disability was secondary. The series won an RTS award for Best Factual Programme. We're very proud of that. This year, BBC Studios will once again be shining a light on disability and diversity, this time through a drama that we're making for BBC Four, Crypt Tales, which is being produced by our documentary unit, sees six actors, each with a disability, perform six different monologues spanning 50 years in British history. Curated by disabled actor Matt Fraser, each one will focus on a pivotal moment, 
or event that shapes and influences the characters and call into question our concept of what the term normal really means. Improving representation across all our output is a critical part of our content strategy. Not because it's a good thing to do, but because it better reflects the society we live in and therefore the lives of our audiences. It's something we strive for on each and every programme. We know we've got a lot more work to do, but as producers, our primary purpose is to tell stories brilliantly. It's the story that matters. In our science unit, the quest to uncover the best scientific stories has led us in many directions, most recently the subject of climate change and the world's attempts to combat it. In April last year, we produced the one-hour documentary, Climate Change, The Facts, for BBC One. The programme was an informative, if sometimes alarming, look at the impact of global warming on our climate. It was driven by facts but in presenting those facts, it offered our audiences the chance to consider some of the possible solutions to this global threat. It offered a tangible and accessible route to change, showing what small steps individuals could take. And in February this year, we announced that the Science Unit had gained exclusive access to one of the youngest and most influential advocates for climate change legislation, Greta Thunberg. This important documentary will give audiences an inside view of Greta's journey as she meets with scientists, business leaders and politicians in her quest to drive legislative change in this criti most critical of issues. And our opportunity to document it is something that makes us very proud. In the NHU, our production teams are expert storytellers. Sometimes that storytelling has helped us to raise awareness of an increasingly global issues like conservation or global warming, just as it did with Blue Planet 2, Dynasties, and most recently with Seven Worlds, One Planet. Or more often than not, it's a vehicle through which our experienced team uncover the unknown, just as they promised to do in the forthcoming Nat Geo series, Mission Ocean X, in which we team up with the makers of one of the most advanced media vessels in, of our time in order to reach and share with audiences the furthest frontiers of the ocean. Occasionally, we use the power of storytelling to draw uncanny parallels between two worlds, um, this is a clip from something that's quite unusual for the NHU, but if you could play it, that'd be great. Ask yourself one question. Why do they call it the animal kingdom when it's clearly run by queens? And when she walks, she walks oh. when she talks, she talks she... Meet the females who give new meaning to eat, is that I spent my life as a child hiding behind the sofa whenever natural history came on because I can't stand the predation bits. Um, that, that's a series that we've made for a new online platform called Quibi that's launching in the US this autumn. It's all short form content, premium short form content. And the brilliant Reese Witherspoon is the presenter of it. We've come over all Hollywood. It's very exciting. <laughs> Um, uh, it's something that turns everything on its head. It's a great series, so look, at that, look out for it if you see it around. Um, but regardless of subject matter, each story promises to be the, everything that audiences come, have come to expect of the NHU. It's ambitious, it's innovative, and above all, it's brilliantly told. The purpose, I said, we believe, is to tell those stories. And of course, sometimes in seeking out those stories, our teams find themselves faced with an issue that's so overwhelming and so timely that there is really just that moment, there and then, to capture it. To ignore it would be, quite frankly, irresponsible. When in 2013, an experienced and hugely ambitious production team within the NHU set about filming the iconic Blue Planet 2, the scale and catastrophic impact of plastic pollution on the world's oceans was something rarely talked about outside of marine biologists and others in the scientific community. Of course, plastic pollution was nothing new. Even 40 years ago, it was estimated that across the Earth's oceans there were approximately 5,000 pieces of plastic per square kilometre. 
But in truth, while the team were aware of that, it was an utmost in their minds. If you speak with series producer Orla Doherty, she'll tell you that this was just one element of oceanic life that they expected to capture. As natural history filmmakers, their mission was to uncover new worlds and capture aquatic and animal life never before seen on screen. But as the production unfolded, a schedule that took them over 125 shoots to 39 different countries and took three years to build, the true impact that plastic was having on marine life became impossible to ignore. For the team, governed by a strong sense of editorial responsibility, it soon became a question of how rather than if they should share their story. The truth of the matter was undeniable. Estimates now suggested that the level of plastic per square kilometre has risen to 50,000 pieces. And as documentary producers, they had a responsibility to bring it to the fore. And so with cutting-edge cinematography, immense dedication and incredible storytelling, the Blue Planet phenomenon, as it's now become, was born. On the 10th of December 2017, the final episode of Blue Planet 2, Our Blue Planet, transmitted on BBC One, and its impact was unprecedented. Here's a quick reminder as to why. But these chicks are being fed something very different. We have some plastic that this poor chick has had to bring up. A plastic bag. Here we have some food packaging, looks like rice. Luckily for this chick, he has managed to get this out of his stomach. So fingers crossed he doesn't have any more plastic left in there before he fledges. For other chicks, plastic can be fatal. Unfortunately, there was a plastic toothpick that had actually gone through the stomach. Something just as small as that has actually has managed to kill the bird. It's, it's really sad to see. As the most watched series of the year, broadcast in over 200 countries and with 80 million views in China in its first week alone, Blue Planet 2's commentary on the state of plastic pollution, brilliantly delivered by Sir David Attenborough, sparked a global campaign against plastic. Since transmission, the programme has gone on to, war to win 28 separate awards, including BAFTAs and a National Television Award for Impact. In September last year, head of the NHU, Julian Hector, spoke at a UN forum attended by politicians, scientists and advocates across the world to discuss the impact and potential strategies for combating plastic pollution. And in November, the NHU and Sir David Attenborough were jointly awarded the Chatham House Prize in recognition for Blue Planet 2's considerable impact on plastic pollution. But more important than the accolades it's received is the impact that the programme's had on the public's attitude to plastic. A poll launched the following year indicated that 88% of people who watched Our Blue Planet changed their approach to using plastics. In March last year, 170 countries, including the UK, pledged to significantly reduce their plastic use by 2030. And separately, the UK government has set a target to eliminate all avoidable plastic waste by 2042. Here was an example of UK filmmaking talent using their talent and their skills and experience to document and drive positive change. And for me, it continues to be one of the most compelling cases for authentic public service broadcasting. But if, as many believe, television would serve as a force of good and should serve as a force for good, then I believe it's as much about what we're doing off screen as it is what we're doing on. So before I close, I want to just touch on that. As one of the biggest natural history producers in the world, our teams here at the NHU are committed to producing content which is not only the most informative and innovative, but also the most sustainable. For some time now, the unit has been an enthusiastic uh, participant in Albert, which is the industry-funded consortium helping producers to minimise the environmental impact of production and inspire audiences to be a more sustainable way of living. We already have a commitment to 100% Albert certification across the unit, and we're strengthening our commitment to carbon neutral programming. The NHU will deliver its first carbon neutral super landmark, Frozen Planet 2, in 2021. 
In representation also, our teams are constantly looking at ways that they might better support and promote a more inclusive and diverse talent base, whether that be on current production, Seven Worlds, One Planet, which transmitted before Christmas and was one of our most diverse shoots, employing 1,500 people from seven different continents across all aspects of production, all by offering greater support to a whole new and much broader generation of talent. Here in Bristol, BBC Studios is part of a thriving production community, and I believe that it's absolutely critical that we continue to nurture it, not just here but across all of our regional bases, because ultimately it's our relationships with new and promising talent that enables us to continue making such ambitious and rewarding content, fully reflecting the audiences that we serve. BBC Studios funds emerging um, camera talent who are employed on our landmarks and hone their craft with specialist supervision and guidance by our NHU producers. BBC Studios also partners with UE in the delivery of their MA Wildlife Filmmaking, um, which has over 20 graduates who are currently employed within studios, um, and others in the wider industry of the UK and abroad. BBC Studios Natural History Units work with the university's Bristol music composition um, for TV and film, and the producers and production managers run a range of seminars and events. I suppose, so I suppose you could say we've made a really good start, but we think there's still more that we can do. We want to grow British filmmaking talent, and for me, it's only in strong partnerships and through continued investment locally and a steadfast commitment to creating a culture in which all of our talent can feel that they're able to work at their best, that we can hope to do so and ensure the health of the UK television industry. For the production teams within BBC Studios, creating content that is at the same time entertaining and impactful, that reflects all of our audiences as well as inspiring them, is something we all strive for. As storytellers working alongside our communities, uncovering new discoveries and capturing the reality of the world in which we live, we have the opportunity to reach people in a way others can't and to give voice to some of the most important issues affecting our audience. We also need to lead by example, and that, to me, is as much a force for good as the stories we send out into the world. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I think we have quite a lot to discuss further, and I'm sure that you've got plenty of questions. Now, we do have a roving mic or two, I hope. Yes. So, is anyone uh, wanting to start the questions off? I've got a huge list myself, but who'd like to start? Got one over here. Oh. Hi, thanks very much. I think uh, it's brilliant and very proud that it's based in Bristol. Um, as a Bristolian, I always point out there's the BBC to all guests. <laughs> so I love it. Um, and I think you're doing brilliant stuff on diversity. I've really enjoyed the series, The Split. I think that's amazing casting because it's so subtle. It's not in your face. So maybe this is a bit of a difficult question, but um, I've loved Women's Hour. But at what stage, when is the timing right to say it's not appropriate to have a programme called the Women's Hour anymore? <laughs> mm, that's a good question. Good so, so, so I'd love to play play into the split, but we didn't make it. It's made by an independent production company, and it's very, very good. So I, I, I recognise that. Um, and I also don't run radio, so I only run this small part of the BBC, which is our production outfit. Um, I think you, you raise a really important point. Um, but in many ways, uh, and I don't know whether Jane agrees with me, hmm. that, that it's become a name, it's become a thing in its own right. I know lots of men who listen to Women's Hour and love it mm. and don't feel that they're excluded from it because it's called Women's Hour. So, so I, I, I think you know, it's a great mm. title, but I can see what you mean. If you want to reflect all audiences, it's a question you might ask. Yeah, but perhaps the uh, discussions might change in the future if, if kind of things change in a, in a broader sense. So maybe it's not a question of not having Woman's Hour, but maybe our concerns in Woman's Hour might be slightly different. Just a thought, not, not to be discussed now, maybe later. Next, next question. We've got one at the back there. 
Do you, yes. You look too, no? <laughs> Good, I'm fine here. Maybe we can design um, microphones yeah. that are easier for women to wear, because unless you've got actually a jacket on, those are very difficult. I know, and they? I didn't think about that. I should have done. Hi there. Um, it's really, really interesting to hear you speak. And um, I think one of the things I wanted to ask, and I, know, I probably do know the answer to a certain extent, um, but programmes such as the, the, the disability programme that you're talking about, a lot of those are on, on, on forums such as BBC Four. When, when, when can we kind of, why, why isn't there more of a push to get more of those things on BBC One and to like stop showing MasterChef every week? Oh, oh I love <laughs> MasterChef. <laughs> um, you know, we, we we have, um, I think, you know, iPlayer is in so many ways um, the opportunity for audiences to access all of our content. Um, and I think that's one of its most amazing strengths is that you can find BBC4, BBC1, BBC2 content really, really easily. Um, and of course, there's always, you know, programmes moving from one channel to another um, are also big, you know, bits of news. Top Gear is going to move to BBC1. That was a big decision. Um, so, but I think what's brilliant about iPlayer is it gives oxygen and, and presence to all of that content in a really brilliant way. I forgot to say, can you please give your name and perhaps where you come from, just to give us a bit of context, who you are when you ask your question? I think we've got one. And then one over there. Hi, James. Uh, not from anywhere. Um, <laughs> I, I, oh, thank, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I wondered if you might be willing to say something about the tension between uh, popularity and sort of what's right and needed, because uh, sometimes the BBC maybe have been guilty of following rather than leading, despite their, you know, their power. And um, maybe a good example is Attenborough. Who, who we, of course, we all love, um, but of course he knew about many of the problems a long, long time ago, but was unwilling to do one-hour blue-chip uh, documentaries because they got low ratings. Um, I think, you know, it, it, it is the power of our storytelling that enables us to bring to light issues that if we were to take a teaching approach, um, a more didactic approach would not be as engaging and therefore wouldn't have the impact that they do. So, uh, you know, there was a long period of time where audiences didn't engage with the issue that was climate change or, you know, the amount of waste that we all create. Um, it's become, you know, we, it's our job to reflect what's important in societies and to, to, to sort of echo that back as well as driving those stories, as I was telling, um, in the first instance. So, uh, you know, I, I think we do an amazing job now of telling stories in a different way, in a way that's really innovative and has a greater impact than maybe if you look back, you know, our storytelling has evolved over time. Um, the, the, the competitive market we sit in has made us be more creative and find new ways of connecting and engaging with audiences. And I think that's been a, a good and a powerful thing. We've, we're pushed to tell different sorts of stories. And, and as we did in Blue Planet, I think we led the way in the stories that we told. Hello, um, Gary Mariner um, from Hewlett Packard Enterprise. I'm also a trustee of a homeless shelter. I've been a huge admirer of the BBC, and one of the things I'd love the BBC to really focus on is rough sleeping. It's a huge, mm. you know, shame in this country, and, and I think it'd be great if you could bring those people to life, make pe make, make it relevant to people in this country. Yeah, and I and I I I think that you're absolutely right, and when you you know, it's a, it's a huge issue for us all nationally. Um, finding ways in which we can tell those stories is, is a, you know, a, an ongoing challenge for us and things we think about a lot in our docs team, um, but we also think about it more broadly across our factual output. But well, you're right, we need to do more to tell those stories. There's a huge source of you know, knowledge mm. in Bristol. Mm. I think we're making uh, you run quite a lot. Next question over here. But 
Maybe, oh, maybe uh, just to add to that um, comment, there's a lot of expectations for a public service broadcaster mm. to do many things. And I think some of the, the questions that are being raised about whether you lead, follow, mm. the breadth of programming, it's probably something you're balancing out every I single know. day in your job, I, I would And imagine. of course, I'm, I'm not a public service broadcaster, so I'm not part of the BBC, I'm part of BBC Studios. So mm. I make the programmes that the BBC commissions us to make, and likewise... For Nat Geo or Discovery or Channel 4 or Channel mm. 5, uh, the commissioners will drive a lot of those decisions. Of course, it's a creative relationship in which we work together to come mm. up with ideas and to tell different stories. But, but I'm not speaking on behalf yeah. of the BBC as, as mm. all of the channels. So um, yeah. I'm only speaking on behalf of the people who make the programmes. Hi, it's Valerie Russell Emmett, Inclusive Practice Lead here at UWE. Uh, really, really interested to hear about the 50-50 project, and you spoke about how presenters, contributors, and experts contributing to programs were tracked over a couple of year process. It's a two-part question. is just wondering, what was the upshot? What was the outcome of having done that project? And then my second question has to do with um, your aspiration to ensure that stories tell challenging counter-stereotypical stories and I'm really interested to know how you embrace and bring in talent uh, as producers, as commissioners who are as diverse as possible. Um, so the first question about the 5050 um, project was that it was so simple it was untrue. It began in one of our news programs on our news channel um, uh, with one advocate who said why don't we just simply count the number of people we have appearing on our television programmes? It was as simple as that. And actually, it delivered results in a remarkably short amount of time. In the beginning, people went, oh, I'm not sure I can achieve that. And, and what we discovered was that you can very easily revert to your typical contributor without going, actually, I'm going to work a little bit harder and find a contributor who's not the same bloke that I've used for the last few years. I'm going to try harder to, to bring in a more diverse um, a, array of contributors. It worked really effectively. Uh, it's so simple. You just count. Um, and it has delivered results. And we do achieve that. Uh, and it, we re achieved it quite quickly, in fact. Um, you talk then about how we bring a, a sort of more diverse people. It, for us, you know, talent, that the UK is a hotbed for creative talent. Uh, there has never been as much opportunity in our market as there is now. Um, we are constantly um, driving opportunities to meet new people and bring new people into our industry because the arrival of Netflix and Amazon, you know, who are attracted by the fact that we have such a brilliantly vibrant creative culture in the UK are driving competition for that talent. So this is a great time to work in television, I would say. Mm. We also work really hard to make sure, because we know we don't do well enough in terms of the diversity of our teams behind the camera or in front of it. We need to do more. We work really hard to source and support talent in all sorts of different ways. So whether that's by the, scream, the, the schemes that we run for young writers who we use really effectively across all of our continuing drama, so people who write for EastEnders and Holby and Casualty, is a great entry point for young writers from a more diverse background. We run that scheme. We have a scheme for Silent Witness that brings in apprenticeships and, mm. and helps and supports new new and young talent to come into our industry. So we have, I counted them up across just BBC Studios, we have about 17 different schemes, all directed at doing, at bringing a more diverse workforce in. As I said, we're not doing it well enough, but we absolutely realise we need to do it better because we have to reflect the audiences that we're talking to. It's only right and reflect the British, British population. Mm. Um, I'll take, uh, next, while you're bring the microphone down here to Steve. Just a, a quick thought. Um, it might be useful to talk a little bit about how you work with other platforms and, and broadcasters because, of course, BBC Studios, obviously a lot of the work is with mm. the BBC. But what about your relationships with, say, Amazon and, and Netflix and so on? Because that's really changed yeah. things, hasn't it? So we, lo we launched commercially two years ago, um, and we had had no commissions at that point. We've now had a lot of commissions, over 40, I think, mm -hmm. from third-party platforms and broadcasters. So we're now in production with the likes of Amazon and Netflix, um, with Apple, with Quibi, who I showed you a bit of, with mm -hmm. Nat Geo, with Discovery, with Channel 4. We've made programmes for ITV. So we make 
make content for a very broad array of different platforms. As I said at the beginning, you know, we still make brilliant content, which has all of the qualities and, and the things that we think are important mm. about the content that we make for the BBC. But what it's done has been to actually, you know, really invigorate and mm. um, the, the BBC's production function. But it, having spent a long time making programmes for only the BBC, yeah. it was much harder to encourage creative people to come and work with us. It became very, you know, you're working for one customer all the time. If they don't like your programme, it doesn't get mm. made. Working in the commercial sector means that our programme makers can have very different, very exciting creative conversations with people all the way around the world. And actually platforms and uh, broadcasters around the world mm -hmm. love the content that we make because it's credible, because it's authentic, because they know in a, in a world of fake news what we do is something different. And that's mm. really appealing. Yeah. And that's why you can sometimes see what you think are BBC programmes on other mm. platforms. Mm. Maybe first, I was thinking of Good Omens. That yes, on Good Omens, we made for Amazon. Yeah. Steve. Hi. Yeah, hi, thanks a lot. Um, my name's Steve Presence. I'm a senior lecturer in film studies here at UWE. Um, I want to ask about BritBox yeah. and what the relationship is between BritBox and BBC Studios. So people might know that BritBox is a kind of uh, subscription platform, sort of the British public service broadcaster's answer to SVODs, maybe, sort of. Uh, and it's a collaboration between BBC and ITV as well, right? Mm -hmm. Really frustrating why Channel 4 isn't part of that yet. I wonder if you might speak to that as well. But I wanted, I wanted, <laughs> wanted, to, wanted to ask um, uh, what the relationship is between you guys and, and BritBox and whether, like, when you make stuff for the BBC, do you, is there some sort of arrangement that, like, after a certain period or window, that's going to go on to BritBox to kind of grow the platform a bit? So the UK, the, the UK, there are many platforms for content in the UK. We call it, you know, what the second window is for our content in the UK. And BritBox is one of those places. And yes, it is a, it's a co-venture with ITV um, and very much about offering a service that is, you know, complementary to but also an alternative to Netflix, for example. Um, you know, I think that what British broadcasters do is create local content. And personally, I believe local content really important. I think viewers want to see their own communities and their own selves reflected back to them rather than always seeing a global view of things. The global view is really important, highly entertaining. I love Netflix, but I think having an alternative is really important. Mm. So yes, that is an important co-venture in, in the UK. Um, and we also have um, uh, BritBox in the US too, which is a subscription service um, that is very successful and it's very niche British content that is content from the, the whole UK market, but is available in the UK as a subscription. Yeah, right, thank you. I think we've got one up here. Yeah. Hi, this is Marielle here. I'm a UE alumni scientist and working in improving public health. What I wondered, because so much, um, so much current public goes to social media, this is so, so our sort of go-to place at the moment. It's actually the TV is maybe sort of not that sourceful anymore. Uh, what is BBC doing to ensure that all this great information you just talked about, actually these global issues, that people know and are aware of this, and that information and how to make this better, because we're all in this together, all these global issues. We have to all contribute to this. How to make sure that these global issues, these tips, get to everybody also in the social media who's not normally looking at TV. So, so I think our natural history landmarks demonstrated something useful to us. So when we launched Planet Earth 2, we took a very different approach to how we launched that digitally. So normally you would see, you know, your linear transmission, everything totally sacrosanct, don't want to creep anything out ahead of a transmission. But with Planet Earth 2, it was very much a, an entire campaign that went across digital and, and across our linear TX. So we did put the most amazing sequences out online really, really quickly. So the iguana and the snake, for example. What that did was bring a 16 to 34-year-old audience who most often wouldn't come to a linear transmission on a Sunday night to the BBC to watch a linear transmission. They also watched it online. So increasingly, our ability to take content and take it to audiences rather than expecting audiences to always come to us 
is really, really important. So, uh, you know, I think our role in that, we don't underplay at all. We have a big digital team um, who are creating short form content in all sorts of ways. We make programs for YouTube, for example, now. We had our first YouTube commission. Mm -hmm. We have YouTube channels that are really important to us as a business because they help us to reach audiences that we wouldn't normally reach. So it's a big part of our emphasis. We're really keen to make sure that we continue to engage with younger audiences. I think it's really important. All audiences, frankly. Yeah. Good. We've got a question up here. Hi, uh, my name's Leila Redway. I'm uh, studying at MSc in Sustainable Development in Practice here at UWE. Um, I understand that the BBC are categorically not a campaigning organisation, and I was wondering, particularly in your present more uh, independent form, how that tallies with your ability to uh, create change. Um, that's a difficult question, isn't it? Um, so I think we don't set out to campaign. We set out in production. We set out to tell stories that are important stories and need to be told. And we do that with as much balance as we can. Um, but we, as I was saying, you know, the story of Blue Planet 2, there was a compelling story we needed to tell. You know, climate change, the facts, was a story we needed to tell. Um, we're doing another series as a follow-up to that, another film as a follow-up to that, which I think is a really important film. Um, we don't, as I said, set out to do that, but that it, we can't avoid but tell those stories, and we think they're important ones to be heard. And what we do is bring them to light, um, is open up that so people can see what's happening. Um, but, yeah. And, but we don't certainly don't campaign for individual organisations. That's not what the BBC does. Mm. Um we do have to um, close that now. Thank you very much for all your questions. And Lisa, thank you for a really fantastic talk and your, your answers there. Um, if anyone's in any doubt of what television can do, I think we saw some great examples today of how television can mobilise people, mobilise communities, take those messages out, and whether it's you know on the verge of campaigning, certainly bringing those issues beyond... Uh, the TV screen, I think the work around climate change in particular. Um, I think the way in which the markets are changing, that you know, mm. we're working with different platforms now, the whole, whole world of television is changing, so there's more places to do good. And I, I think I'd like to leave you with, with one thought, which is we've talked a lot about the power of television to, uh, to engage us in some of these really important issues. I think the other thing that television does, which also has great value, is that it brings pleasure and enjoyment mm. into our lives as well. And when you look around at all the, uh, the, the sort of chaos that is out there in the world, actually we need good stories to remind us what it's like to be human mm. and actually to bring comfort and, and kind of pleasure and a bit of joy into our living room. So I, I think we've, we've had a bit of that as well today. So <laughs> thank you very much, Lisa. Thank Please, you. will you join me in thanking Lisa? And we have <laughs>